Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see everybody here on this sunny day. It's incredible. I think it's a, a tribute to the topic um, and to our speaker. Um, my name is Louisa Wood Ruby, and I'm head of the research department here at the Frick Art Reference Library. Um, this is the ninth lecture of our Digital Art History Lab, a virtual lab founded in the library in 2014 to stimulate research and scholarship in the field of art history using the most recent digital technologies. As more and more of the library's resources become available online, we're committed to finding new ways to access and share them with the wider public, all the while remaining cognizant that the digital world can never fully replace the depth of resources available through our books and archives. On April 15th of this year, the world was shocked and dismayed by images of Notre Dame on fire. Disbelief and pain were the most common reactions. Were any people hurt? How bad was the damage? Did the rose windows survive? The art? Soon afterwards, there were reports about the rebuilding. Could it be done? How? How long would it take? How much would it cost? It was then that we learned about a digital project begun by the late Dr. Andrew Talon in 2010 to make a complete 3D laser mapping of the cathedral. How wonderful, we thought, if we could see those scans here at the Frick to highlight how the digital can be used to rescue the real world. Having had Dr. Talon's mentor, Dr. Stephen Murray of Columbia University here last year to speak about his work on the Cathedral of Amiens, we knew that amazing images of this type um, are very interesting and very good to look at, and we tracked Lindsay Cook down to ask if she would like to speak to us today. Thankfully, she agreed, and I now have the pleasure of introducing her. Dr. Lindsay Cook is visiting assistant professor of art at Vassar College, where she teaches medieval art and architecture. Her research focuses on the intersection of architectural and institutional history of the Middle Ages and the creation of the image of Notre Dame of Paris. She earned her BA in art history and French from Vassar College and her MA, MPhil, and PhD from the Department of Art, History, and Archaeology at Columbia University. In 2010 and 11, she participated in two successive field sessions of Mapping Gothic France, a multi-year digital humanities project envisioned by Stephen Murray, Andrew Talon, and Rory O'Neill, and supported by a major grant from the Mellon Foundation. Lindsay took panoramic photographs in Paris, the Ile de France, Burgundy, and southwestern France for the project, which aims to present the spatial, temporal, and narrative dimensions of Gothic architecture. This invaluable cache of images is freely accessible to the public at mappinggothic.org. This coming spring, Penn State University Press will publish Notre Dame of Paris Through Time, Lindsay's English translation of the book first published in 2013 in French as Notre Dame de Paris, Neuf Siècles d'Histoire, co-authored by Sorbonne art history professor Dani Sandran and the late Vassar art history professor Andrew Talon. Lindsay is also in the process of revising for publication her dissertation entitled Architectural Citation of Notre Dame of Paris in the Land of the Paris Cathedral Chapter, a study of the architectural and institutional connections between the Cathedral of Paris and village churches on the city's periphery. Please join me in welcoming Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Louisa, for your kind introduction and for inviting me to speak in the Digital Art History Lab. It is a privilege and a real pleasure to be here at the Frick Collection, and thank you all out there for being here today to hear about the conservation and restoration of Notre Dame of Paris and the place of Andrew Talon's laser scans in that effort. On that note, I am incredibly grateful, particularly to Marie Tallon, for giving me her blessing to speak publicly about her late husband's research since his untimely death less than a year ago. In French, the verb disparaître, to disappear, is used to refer both to an object that has vanished and, more euphemistically, to a person who has died. So, Rather than elle est morte, she died, a newspaper article about the death of, say, a famous actress might instead read, elle a disparu. Literally, she disappeared. Similar to the English expression, she passed away. My presentation today invokes both senses of that term 
to chart the double disappearance that le has led us to assemble in this beautiful space today. The first sort of disappearance refers to the vanishing of Notre Dame of Paris as we all knew it. The details of the cat this catastrophe, no doubt familiar to many of you, bear repeating. On the evening of April 15th, 2019, an alarm sounded during mass at the Cathedral of Paris, setting in motion the evacuation of the public. Yet the priest carried on, eventually sending the organist, of all people, to double check on the alarm. A series of miscommunications followed, the security employee on the clock was new, and the arcane labeling system on the alarm console led to the misinterpretation of the signal and initially seemed to indicate a false alarm. And as a result, the fire department was not called for about half an hour. By the time the firefighters arrived, the blaze was roaring under the gabled wooden roof. The firefighters, familiar with the ins and outs of the cathedral, from the drills they had run to prepare for such a disaster at that very site, entered the fray. Eventually bolstering their efforts was a vast amount of water pumped from the Seine. All of a sudden, the cathedral's position within the city, surrounded by the river, became more than a picturesque accident of history. The lead covering of the roof and spire melted. The wooden framework of both roof and spire burned, splintered, and fell to pieces. While most of this, this debris fell onto the tops of the vaults, the concentration of material from the spire led it to break through the central crossing vault and membranes of the other vaults of the, north tr of the transept arm, with molten lead likewise flowing forth into the central vessel via these eerie apertures. But the fire did not stop there. It spread to the wooden belfry of the north tower of the main facade, so not actually the stone tower that we're seeing here, but the belfry within it. At a certain point, the Paris Fire Brigade Commander General Jean-Claude Gallet made the decision to give up on the main roof and concentrate on the fire in the North Tower. The firefighters feared that if the belfry continued to burn, the fire would spread to the wooden belfry in the South Tower, destroy the belfries in both, and transform the massive bronze bells suspended from these internal wooden structures into careening projectiles. This approach was extremely effective. What's even more astonishing is that it succeeded without the death of a single firefighter or civilian. So at this point, I'm showing you this image from the past taken in this case in 2010 in the context of the field session Louisa mentioned a moment ago mapping Goth of map mapping Gothic France. What was lost, of course, was the spire we're seeing here, the roof um, here covered in this lead covering, um, and the fire had at some point spread into the belfry on the North Tower. A fire is a fire is a fire. And the sights live streamed across the globe on April 15th, such as this still from drone footage taken after the collapse of the spire, paralleled medieval descriptions of great fires from the time when Notre Dame of Paris was under construction in the second half of the 12th century. Of the 1174 fire at Canterbury Cathedral, the chronicler Gervais wrote, quote, Cinders and sparks carried aloft by the high wind were deposited upon the church, and being driven by the fury of the wind between the joints of the lead, remained there amongst the half-rotten planks, and shortly glowing with increasing heat, set fire to the rotten rafters. From these, the fire was communicated to the larger beams and their braces, no one yet perceiving or helping. He's again mentioning the disconnect between the building underneath and the wooden roof above, hidden from view. He continues, for the well-painted ceiling below and the sheet lead covering above concealed between them the fire that had arisen within. Meantime, the three cottages whence the mischief had arisen being destroyed and the popular excitement having subsided, everybody went home again, while the neglected church was consuming with internal fire unknown to all. A very similar thing happened here. Gervais continues, 
but beams and braces burning, the flames rose to the slopes of the roof, and the sheets of lead yielded to the increasing heat and began to melt. Thus the raging wind, finding a freer entrance, increased the fury of the fire, and the flames beginning to show themselves, a cry arose in the churchyard. See, see, the church is on fire. We all know where we were when we heard that Notre Dame was on fire in April. We can feel some empathy for the chronicler of the 12th century. By the morning of Tuesday, April 16th, an assessment of the damage could begin in earnest. Gone was the 13th century roof, its trusses composed of whole oak trees. Now split and burnt to a crisp, they littered the crossing and choir and charged the tops of the vaults. So you're seeing them here, some of them sort of incinerated, covering and actually wait, starting to weight down the vaults where they used to stand above them, not connected to them at all. Gone was the 19th century spire, a product of the imagination of restoration architect Villers-le-Duc, who did tip his hat to the cathedral's medieval spire, dismantled in the 18th century, even if his spire design knowingly departed from the original in significant respects. Gone was the majority of the crossing vault and some segments of the vault webbing of the transept arms. So you're seeing that here as well. Um, the transept, the, the uh, crossing here underneath the scaffolding and the transept here, you can see gaping holes um, in, in vaults of the transept as well. Yet much remained intact. The damage to the masonry certainly could have been far worse than it was. Most of Notre Dame's stone skeleton, composed of piers, pointed arches, and masonry vaults, was weakened by the fire and the water used to put it out, but not broken. And all of the monumental sculpture, decorative ironwork, and stained glass remained in place. The firefighters affiliated with the Musée du Louvre, trained specifically to rescue works of art and other precious objects, even managed to recover the relics and reliquaries, altar pieces, sanctuary carpets, and other ornaments and church furnishings kept in the cathedral. Nevertheless, the fire did distort the image of Notre Dame. The cathedral, as we have always known it, vanished. This brings us to the disappearance of the other sort. The April 2009 disappearance of the Notre Dame we all knew shone a spotlight on the November 2018 disappearance of Andrew Tallon, the architectural historian, longtime Vassar College art history professor, and my own undergraduate mentor. The fire transformed this personal loss, suffered privately by Tallon's family, friends, colleagues, and students, into a public spectacle. Due in large part to one stray tweet, a narrative emerged in the news media shortly after the Notre Dame fire was extinguished that a laser scan made by Andrew Tallon would be helpful in the restoration of the cathedral. To my mind, the absolute certainty of the messengers that this data would definitely be useful to the architect en chef of Notre Dame initially rubbed me the wrong way. And the very idea that the existence of a computer file could somehow soften the blow of the death of a promising scholar seemed somewhat ghoulish even. Yet there is a kernel of truth in this story, and it is that kernel of truth I would like to unearth today. In 2010, with the financial backing of the producers of a documentary eventually broadcast on the European arts and culture television station Arte, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this wonderful channel, as Les Cathédrales Dévoilées, or Cathedrals Unveiled, and with technical assistance from a company and several individual subcontractors, some of them you're seeing here in this image, Andrew Tallon used a laser scanner manufactured by Leica Geosystems to produce a full laser scan of Notre Dame of Paris from pavement to spire. In 2010, he returned with an even more sophisticated laser scanner to scan the Western frontispiece specifically in order to capture its texture to a greater extent than ever before. Here we see the result of that 2012 laser scan. So you'll, you will have noticed, I think, as you came in and sat down, that you weren't looking at a photograph. It was more perfect, uh, more regular, and just quite different uh, than, than the 
visual um, impression that a photograph makes to us. The laser scans began by placing a series of reflective targets on the surface of the building. Then the laser scanner was placed in dozens of spots throughout the cathedral to capture every nook and cranny. In a PBS special called Building the Great Cathedrals, this was broadcast through Nova, Andrew Tallon explained what came next in his characteristic way with a blend of technical language and a heavy dose of Midwestern charm that bordered on folksiness, which I say very fondly as a native Midwesterner myself. Quote, the laser scanner sends a little laser beam out from its eye and it measures a thousand times a second the distance between itself and whatever it's hitting. And so, as it slowly pans across the wall, it's shooting out this laser and taking a whole series of measurements, which are then represented in three dimensions as a series of X, Y, Z coordinates. Laser scanning is an efficient means of measuring an entire edifice, resulting in a mass of data known as a point cloud. That data set may then be sliced into smaller pieces and examined more closely using analytical software such as Vectorworks, Cloudcaster, and Cyclone. You're seeing an example of a slice right here. And just to make it very clear what we're seeing, we're seeing a, basically a bay. So we see a couple of flying buttresses and a slice of the building. So you can look in and see bits and pieces of the roof, the covering of the roof as well. And it becomes particularly apparent from this kind of angle, the fact that the vaults are really independent of the wooden roof above. So while they do bear down and, and exert force onto the outer walls, they're not actually placed on top of the vaults. This was something that was, I, I suppose, remarkable for everyone to learn uh, through the fire. It's unfortunate that it took that for people to understand this much about medieval architecture. While this data from the Notre Dame laser scans has become a priceless record, digitally preserving the cathedral in its state prior to the conflagration, Talon's own reasons for employing this technology in 2010 and 2012 were entirely different. The primary reason he wanted a laser scan of Notre Dame of Paris was to understand more fully the nature of Gothic structure and to pinpoint structural anomalies in the cathedral. He was as interested in this pursuit in irregularity as he was in regularity. The most significant result from this approach taken at Notre Dame led Talon to confirm Stephen Murray's hypothesis that single-span flying buttresses had been planned from the outset of construction around 1160, not added after the fact as a reaction to structural concerns, as some scholars had posited previously. For instance, in the hypothetical graphic reconstruction published in Alain Erland Brandenburg's 1997 monograph, the cathedral's upper walls appear unsupported entirely by flying buttresses in the initial version of the Gothic building. So you're seeing nothing supporting all of the superstructure here. According to this hypothesis, the flying buttresses were added later on in response to structural problems. If this hypothesis were correct, then we would expect the upper walls of the choir to have moved to some extent, buckling in the middle and splaying out toward the top resulting from the thrust of the high vaults before the flying buttresses were added. So we would expect movement particularly of this, this upper wall here if, if this part of the building was unsupported in this way for quite a long time, as this reconstruction would suggest. On the contrary, the 2010 laser scan showed that the walls were more or less perfectly straight or in plumb and thus must have been supported by some kind of flying buttresses from the outset. That is, the distance between the walls remains consistent, whether that distance is measured closer to the ground, so if we measure this distance across the building, this down here, or closer to the high vaults, so closer, this measurement is almost exactly the same as this one. This finding suggests that flying buttresses of one kind or another have always supported this part of the cathedral the East End, the part that was built first. And Talon happened to share the view with his teacher and mine, Stephen Murray, that the form of those buttresses always looked more or less the way they do today. Some of Andrew, Andrew Talon's findings were published in the 2013 book he co-authored with Sorbonne architectural history professor 
and researcher Dany Sondron, entitled Notre Dame de Paris, Neuf Siècles d'Histoire. A new, slightly revised French edition of this book was published mere days after the 2019 fire. It's a very public, um, publicly easily accessible book, and so it's re a real testament to people's interest in this building in after, immediately after the fire that it had to be reissued very shortly thereafter. This coming spring, as we heard earlier, Penn State University Press will publish my English translation of that latest French edition. Its provisional title, as we heard, is Notre Dame of Paris Through Time. This cathedral was not a static monument. It transformed again and again over the decades and the centuries. The laser scans of 2010 and 2012 are at the very core of this book. For instance, the laser scans served as the basis for the drafting of a new ground plan of the cathedral in what would be fair to call the first accurate plan of the building. For generations, plans of Notre Dame were tidied up or corrected to appear more regular than the building actually is. In reality, the cathedral's ground plan is far more idiosyncratic. Here, for instance, we see a slice of the laser scan from the level of the high vaults, so you can actually see the um, ribs here of the high vaults throughout forming uh, a cross throughout the building. And in this view, the plasticity of the vault ribs is particularly apparent. So you'll see that they have this sort of sinuous curve to them. They're not X's as you might see them on a more formal, finished, tidied up plan. A slice capturing the lower vaults of the nave, aisles, and ambulatory was also needed to draft a new plan. The finished plan fused together the two cross sections I have just showed you. So here we're seeing, as you can see, the cross section was taken at a lower point, and so you're seeing the covering these, uh, again, the ribs of the outer aisles and all the way around the ambulatory, but no longer the high vaults because we're at a slice that's lower than the high vaults. Nowhere is the cathedral's irregularity more visible in the resulting plan than in the nave piers, represented on the left side of this image of the ground plan as dark blue circles inscribed within squares. So I'll point them out to you if you're not familiar with looking at a ground plan of a Gothic cathedral, here we are. These are the piers I'm referring to. I invite you to select one of these dark blue circles and use your imagination to project a straight line out from the center of one circle and all the way across the nave. Does your imaginary line hit the center of the blue circle at the opposite end of the nave? Not quite, right? As you will have noticed, each pier of the South Nave Arcade is positioned slightly to the right or east of the corresponding pier on the north side of the nave. So these piers are all a bit to the right, a bit to the east of these piers here. Even more remarkable than these idiosyncrasies, you start to wonder how does this building stand up if it has these kinds of disparities, right? <laughs> Is the perfect regularity of the analogous supports in the choir. So we might also just be astonished that this building stood up in the 12th century in the first place, but look at how perfectly um, these piers are oriented according to the position of these piers. So the east end is much more regular than the west end, and this suggests that something was going on over here. It's a, a reason to look again at this plan. The 3D laser scan may have mapped this irregularity to a greater degree of accuracy than ever before, but it is the kind of anomaly that was actually long visible inside the building with the naked eye, if you knew to look for it. If you were standing, if you were to stand in the central vessel of Notre Dame with your back against a pier and look straight ahead, you would see not the center of another pier as you would expect, but rather a void. Very scary to see that when you're standing in the building or else the edge of the opposite pier. The laser scan also revealed more subtle shifts, and this is particularly true in this image. For instance, the 2010, or 2012 scan of the Western frontispiece makes it clear that this part of the building settled as it was constructed. Follow the lines, or string courses, overhead and at the feet of the monumental crowned figures, 
positioned above the three main portals. So I'm talking about these figures that you're seeing here, the gallery of kings, and the lines that you're seeing below their feet and above their heads. So follow those lines. Scan the surface of the building with your eyes from right to left. Does this look to you like a straight horizontal line? No. The line has a slight downward slope to it, indicating that this massive construction settled unevenly as the Western frontispiece was built, beginning around the turn of the 13th century. You can imagine as the Masons were working, the cathedral is really, it's sinking um, to one side and was corrected. Judging by these examples, it is clear that the laser scan effectively captured what was there when the scan was made in 2010 and 2012. Moreover, the scan served as the basis for a whole series of digital reconstructions, reimagining historical states of the building, published in Sandron and Talon's 2013 book I mentioned earlier. The graphic designer Laurent Stefanon rendered the hypothetical reconstructions, layering appropriate textures on top of the laser scan data, as if it were skin stretched over a skeleton. As accurate as the measurements of the underlying structure are, these reconstructions also reflect specific scholarly points of view. For instance, in this hypothetical reconstruction of the 1177 state of the cathedral, we find single span flying buttresses, much like the ones rebuilt later on, yet more simply ornamented. So this is a scholarly opinion um, that's being rendered in this reconstruction. Along the same lines, brightly colored paint adorns the sculpted surfaces of the Western frontispiece from the three portals to the Gallery of Kings in this digital reconstruction of the 1245 state of Notre Dame. And the space between the nave buttresses has been filled in, so we're talking about these spaces here, transformed into a series of chapels. This rendering is also conjectural in parts. For example, since few traces of the 12th century Notre Dame transept remain, the north transept facade visible here is based upon the facade of a late 12th century abbey church. So this facade here has nothing to do with anything that scholars know about Notre Dame of Paris. This was completely taken down in the 13th century, and so in this case, it's very conjectural. Keep your eye on that very lateral facade as we flash forward to the year, to around the year 1300. Here again, we find the cathedral in flux with gabled cladding affixed to the exterior envelope of the cathedral and lofty pinnacles reinforcing the buttress uprights. So you now see that the buttresses have started to change. They're more sort of prickly. You feel like you would be pricked if you were to pick up the building with your hands. The overall look of these hypothetical reconstructions raises questions about how to represent conjecture and scholarly uncertainty in this kind of exercise in the digital arena. Using a highly accurate 3D model as the canvas for such projections makes the result convincing, seductive even, and utterly pleasing to look at. But it also imbues the whole with an aura, a kind of truth value they were never intended to project. Together, these three hypothetical historical reconstructions and the accurate ground plan I have uh, have, I hope, given you a clearer picture of some of the applications Andrew Tallon envisioned for the laser scan during his lifetime. The Notre Dame fire itself has brought to light new applications for the laser scan of Notre Dame, originally gathered for entirely different reasons. Here we see a rendering of the north transept facade from the 2010 scan. What new applications for this technology has the fire presented? With a margin of error of only five millimeters, the scan is an incredibly accurate digital record of the cathedral as it stood before the fire. In his Chronicle of the Blaze, Dans les Flammes de Notre Dame, published in June, journalist Sébastien Spitzer presents a blow-by-blow -blow of the emergency response. He specifically addresses various technologies from pen and ink drawings to drones employed the night of the fire to monitor the efficacy of the firefighting efforts. Notably, Spitzer writes that around 9.30 p.m. Paris time, dozens of targets were placed on the western frontispiece and transept facades to enable crews to use laser measuring devices to monitor the structural stability of the cathedral, particularly its north transept facade, which I've shown you here in, an, in the earlier scan. 
This course of action, the very night of the fire, signaled that first responders feared for the structure of Notre Dame. These fears have not dissipated in the subsequent weeks and months. In early May, once the dust had settled, the company Art Graphique et Patrimoine conducted a new complete laser survey of Notre Dame. The 2010 and 2012 scans, therefore, provide a snapshot of the cathedral prior to the blaze. With this scan serving as the baseline, it could be compared to the May 2019 laser scan to identify differences between them before and after. These differences would indicate movement in the building and pinpoint areas of structural concern. If this initial comparison were to indicate areas of stress, additional laser surveys could also be conducted periodically in the future to monitor the situation. Here, we see a post-fire photograph of this same zone that I showed you in the laser scan a moment ago. With the gable of the north transept facade not enclosing a wooden roof for the first time since it was added in the mid 13th century. And this is really a cause for, for concern, and also the fact that you still have the presence of the steel scaffolding that was erected to um, undertake the restoration efforts just months before. Monitoring the movement of surviving parts of the cathedral is one thing. But what about the parts of the building that were lost entirely? As we know, the spire became engulfed in flames, its lead covering melted, and its de desiccated blackened wood core crashed through the crossing vault. The most dramatic application of the laser scan would be for architect en chef Philippe Villeneuve to use the 2010 and 2012 scans in his designs for the restoration. A bill introduced in the French Senate last spring and after several revisions signed into law at the end of July by French President Emmanuel Macron as law 2019-803 led several senators to recommend adding language stipulating that the new cathedral must take the same form as the version that stood on the plaza immediately before the fire. While this language did not ultimately make it into the text of the law, Philippe Villeneuve, the architect, has indicated that he will restore the spire à l'identique, identically. Whether you are relieved by this likely course of action or feel it is a missed opportunity for innovation, it does present the intriguing possibility that the laser scan could be helpful in this process. For the spire in particular, the laser scan could be of use. The utility of the laser scan will be far more limited with respect to the restoration of the roof. While the laser scan could be helpful in recreating the roof line, so the general outline, and that really actually does give a lot of the look of the overall cathedral, the silhouette, the scan of the wooden roof trusses will be of less value to the restoration effort, as the new roof will almost certainly be made of a material more fireproof than wood. It is worth recognizing that our conception of this cathedral and approaches to its restoration are thoroughly modern. And thus, it is little wonder that modern technology might be part of the solution. If a fire on the scale of the one that raged at Notre Dame this year had occurred in the 12th century rather than the 21st, the building would have been rebuilt more or less from the ground up, as was the case at Canterbury Cathedral after the 1174 fire and Chartres Cathedral after the 1194 fire there. And the buildings as we know them were the aftermath of, of these important great conflagrations. The disappearance of part of the structure at Notre Dame is no more lamentable to us today than similar losses were to people back then. But we put more stock than ever before in Notre Dame's value as a historic structure, more so than we do its importance as a sacred site or its power as a symbol for the city of Paris or the nation of France. Following the 1194 fire at Chartres, a contemporary miracle account reports that, quote, the inhabitants of Chartres, clerics as well as lay people, whose homes and practically all their furnishings the aforementioned fire had consumed, all deplored the destruction of the church to such an extent that they made absolutely no mention of their own losses. They considered as their chief misfortune, or rather the totality of their misfortune, the fact that they, unhappy wretches, in justice 
in justice for their own sins, had lost the palace of the Blessed Virgin, the special glory of the city, the showpiece of the entire region, the incomparable house of prayer, end quote. Today, we tend to focus primarily on the loss of the medieval roof, 19th century spire, as well as the loss of the public access to the interior and the vast majority of the great plaza to the west of the church. As the conservation and restoration of Notre Dame unfolds, there are numerous ways to follow this story and stay engaged with the monuments of medieval France. First of all, I encourage you to read more scholarship in addition to investigative journalism. This book, of course, is one short, accessible, beautifully illustrated way to do this. But if you're interested in a deeper dive, the scholarly articles in English about the structure and geometry of Notre Dame, authored by Caroline Bruzelius, Bill Clark, Michael Davis, Stephen Murray, Marvin Trachtenberg, Stefan von Liefering, and Christopher Wilson in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s are all essential. If you have French, a whole world of literature will open up to you, as will the website of the newly formed group of international scholars known as Scientifique Notre Dame. The resources available there, completely free and open to the public, are generally excellent, although not peer-reviewed. So this is the URL that you're seeing at the top of the screen. Explore, too, some of the digital resources featuring, docu featuring documentation of earlier states of Notre Dame, including the website Mapping Gothic France, the new panorama tour of Notre Dame mounted by the Media Center for Art History at Columbia University, which brings together lots of media related to the Cathedral of Paris, largely coming from Mapping Gothic, but also from other sources. The recent Getty Iris feature is also worth considering, even if you won't make it to the related Getty exhibition in Los Angeles. And the online exhibition of historical photographs presented by the Conway Library of the Courtauld Institute demonstrates the changing face of Notre Dame since the invention of photography in the mid-19th century. Perhaps most importantly, follow closely the conservation and restoration efforts themselves, which will likely stretch far into the future, beyond the optimistic estimate of five years initially promised by the President of the Republic. The morning after the fire, architect en chef des monuments historiques, Philippe Villeneuve, identified the top priorities for stabilizing the structure to guarantee a safe and secure environment in which conservators and restorers may confidently intervene. At the top of this list was protect, protecting the building from the elements. The fire, as we know, took place on a Monday, and by Friday of that same week, a series of structured white tarps resembling a line of giant umbrellas already covered the tops of the vaults, keeping them dry. So you're seeing them poking out here a little bit, and if you've been to the cathedral since the fire, you'll know that if you stand at the East End, for instance, and take in more or less this view, you'll be able to see them sort of flapping in the wind um, if it's a windy day. The next item on the architect's list is to dismantle the scaffolding that had been put up around the spire for the restoration just getting underway when the fire broke out. So you're seeing that here. This is new, but this is old. And it, it, it burned and is certainly a, a cause for concern if it were to start um, breaking and also charging the vaults even further. The final item on this list is to secure the vaults. This effort is now well underway and will culminate in the removal of the roof debris from the tops of the vaults. To make this precarious intervention, beams will be installed along the width of the main vessel and worker, workers will rappel down from these beams to direct the cranes responsible for lifting the debris and removing it from the mortar-coated stone vaults. This is a very elaborate task. It sounds like they, they'll, it will soon be underway. Teaching in Paris this past summer on the left bank, I chose to live on the right bank, specifically so that I would get to pass by the cathedral on my morning commute. I made this housing decision prior to the April fire, hoping to see the building daily to advance my own research. Instead, each day I witnessed the ever-changing face of the urgent consolidation effort. In some cases, these stabilizing maneuvers mirrored to a great extent the medieval construction of Notre Dame. For instance, much of the formwork recently installed to cradle the flying buttresses resembles the formwork scholars believe was used to construct the great Gothic cathedral in the 12th and 13th centuries, and certainly to restore it in the 19th. So you're seeing a bit of that peeking out here. They're great um, wooden, mostly wooden formworks. 
On your next trip to Paris, take the time to get as close as you can to Notre Dame and check in on the status of that project. And until it's safe to go back inside, take the opportunity to visit other Gothic sites in France. <laughs> as the late art historian Michael Camille famously wrote in the opening pages of his posthumously published book, The Gargoyles of Notre Dame, quote, there are many churches dedicated to Notre Dame, but there is only one, Notre Dame de Paris, well we know. But there are equally, if differently, impressive monuments throughout the country awaiting your visit. The cathedrals of Bourges, Chartres, Reims, Amiens, Beauvais, Clermont-Ferrand all have something to offer. And more than ever, we must not take these hulking structures for granted. That's the lesson I've learned as someone who studies Notre Dame specifically. Finally, we might put this loss, this vanishing act, in perspective. For quite some time after the fire, I agonized over the fact that Notre Dame would never again be the same. Until one sweltering August day, I found myself shoulder to shoulder with hundreds of others ascending the steps of the Acropolis and passing through the columns of the Propylaia, and it dawned on me that few people visit that sacred rock to see intact structures with the exception of a handful of disgruntled TripAdvisor reviewers, one of whom, I can tell you, uh, referred to the Athenian Acropolis as, quote, an overrated construction site. <laughs> Similarly, the draw of Notre Dame of Paris was never primarily its completeness. We might ta all take some solace in the fact that the virtues of this magnificent cathedral do remain, even if they did not escape the fire completely unscathed and are temporarily encased in steel, wrapped in unsightly plastic and stiffened by wood. Eventually, Notre Dame's vaults will re be repaired and its roof and spire will be reconstructed. Some years from now, the cathedral will reopen to the public, looking cleaner and newer, yes, but more or less like it did before in all likelihood. And in the interim, we have the point cloud data, a precious digital record of the Notre Dame we all knew a ghost of what was, and maybe even, if needed, a template for the cathedral of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for that very thoughtful and for me, anyway, moving um, presentation of Notre Dame. I think now we have uh, quite a bit of time for questions and thoughts and comments for everybody if they would like to, anyone would like to make one, some questions. I was gonna make one comment that the symbolism of the fire Notre Dame is uh, perhaps the same symbolism as what befell the Twin Towers here in New York vis vis the national um, appreciation of those structures symbolically. I was, I was also wondering, you know, uh, given the treasure that Notre Dame is, you know, there is a paint called intumescent paint, which you probably know of, mm -hmm. which we use in structures, which stalls a fire for over two hours because a thin coat of paint expands 50 times and will allow a 560 degree Celsius <clears throat> or 1,040 degree Fahrenheit to incur before structure collapses, and why with this kind of structure, the, um, the exposing of the structure itself wasn't attended to as this national treasure with this, a very thin coat of paint, I think 45 mils, mm -hmm. to stall to allow fire departments to come in and attend to any potential damage that a structure might encounter. I certainly think that this is going to open up a whole um, round of debate, particularly in the Monument Historique, about what to do and how to treat buildings who could easily have the same thing befall them. Um, and it's really too bad that more precautions weren't taken in this case. All of the, the plans that we saw that, were, um, that had been published and put together, the, the sort of plan for this kind of event, they thought it was going to take much longer to, to transpire, and it, it, it went very quickly, as we saw. Thank you very much for an illuminating talk. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is until recently, we were reading that in fact, uh, the entire edifice could still collapse. Mm -hmm. So compromised was the limestone. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Do you have any fresh information that maybe the consolidation should give us a little comfort? Something that is very alarming to me is the fact that they paused these emergency efforts for, for a brief time when they were concerned about the lead content um, that was emitted as the roof burned, of course, as we know, and melted. Um, and the fact that in spite of the lead, the emergency work had to resume, is very, that's very alarming to me. Um, and I do know that there had been some sort of good signs from this, um, the initial sort of um, tests that have been done, that I, I just doubt that it will collapse tomorrow, but there are still a lot of concerns, particularly for the mortar. Um, that's, that's where the, the greatest concern is, the gravest concern. You said you had a second question. I have a second question. Mm -hmm. you, you showed a number of other cathedrals in France. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wonder whether, the, do you know, whether the authorities in Paris are in fact pointing and trying to promote a cathedral built 20 years before Notre Dame in Paris itself called Saint-Denis, one course. of the great cathedrals yes. of France, <laughs> and maybe get people to go and see that? You know, in fact, they were really pushing Saint-Denis for a while just recently because there's a restoration project there that's very controversial um, to actually reconstruct the one of the towers um, that fell down. And so I think, as far as I know, that restoration project is still going to take place. And so there, it was already part, especially um, with the challenges France has been facing lately, Saint-Denis has been a sort of target for, for the French government for a long time and for the cultural services in general. And I think saint has, for all of its symbolic resonance, has, has always been on the radar um, uh, among the authorities. Whether that takes off and whether people listen is another question entirely. The centrality of this cathedral is part of why we all know it, part of pi why 13 million people went there last year. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, um, yeah, in the back. Can I ask a question, right? Do, do we know with complete certainty the cause of that fire? Could it have been arson? There was a police investigation that was conducted, and there was no um, sign that there was anything untoward about the fire. Um, they think it was either a, an electrical short or simply a, a, a butt of a cigarette that was left, and that was the sort of final word on that from the police. Um, you've talked about using the laser scan for reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you know if it's currently being used to compare uh, where the stones are now to help stabilize the building so that uh, it doesn't weaken and collapse? This is exactly the, I think that's most likely to be the way that it's used ultimately. Right now, they're still dismantling the scaffolding um, and the vaults, it's more of a, as things fall down, they're making sure that nothing more falls down. But once they get to the point where they're really analyzing stone by stone, what is there and what was there before? Is it in the same position that it was before? That's where the laser scan would really come into play. Um, the scan was already shared with the architect en chef who preceded Philippe Villeneuve, um, and so it may already be, be in the possession, and the idea is also to find a way to donate it specifically to the cathedral as opposed to an individual so that well into the future it can be used for this restoration campaign. Uh, I believe you said that the stained glass Mm -hmm. was preserved or mm -hmm. the fire attempts yes. of the firemen. Could you go into a little more detail? On, it's an incredible has it been survival. Or, some of um, your yes, indeed. It? So maybe I can go back and show you. Do you see that it looks as if there are band-aids or s sort of plastic baggies covering all the clear story windows? Um, so this is covering, there's no longer any glass. This was 19th century glass that was here, but of course 13th century and 19th century glass in the rose windows. Um, so here you're seeing all of the 19th century glass from the clear story removed. You can see what I was saying about going back to the Middle Ages, there's wooden formwork that you now see. So a triangle in each oculus. Um, it's a really remarkable sight. Um, and then they've been covered with this plastic material over the surface to protect them. So they've been taken down, but they're all, they're, they're safe. And the idea, yes, it's, a, it's amazing. There has been some um, idea that there is a bit of micro cracking potentially in the 13th century glass of the rose. Um, that's what this, I'm not a stained glass specialist, but that's what glass specialists have, have suggested. So that's something certainly to monitor, but it looks like the kind of thing that can be repaired um, and there will be a, obviously a, a careful conservation of the glass. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the vaults, uh, I assume they were the stone. Yes. And my question is, are they going to be reconstructed also the same way from the restored, I mean, re recuperated stones from the, because they fell down, 
or they're going to be used, they're going to be using uh, new stones of the same kind, or it's going to be uh, new concrete, <laughs> reinforced concrete, uh, using the same shape and so on. Because in fact, the vault, it was not a structural element, it was the fireproofing of the wooden roof. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, part of what they are doing, and if you have been to Paris, you will have seen this when the gates happen to be open, is that there are great sheds collecting stones and other material uh, from the building, either as it falls or as they've cleaned it up after the fire. And those are being cataloged. But the idea, most likely, especially for the stones of the crossing vault, I think is what you're referring to, so the central yes, crossing vault, um, and perhaps also the transept vaults. The most arches, you know, the most likely, these things will be restored with new stone, but of the same, the original, as close as you can get to the type of limestone that was used initially. Um, that's largely because this, because it suffered, limestone does of course suffer from heat and water application. And so that's, at least in my experience, what I've seen in the past of other projects, it's most likely what will happen. But it's not the, the primary focus yet. Excuse me, and the, the structure of the roof itself, mm -hmm. it will be in wood again, or it will be in aluminum or steel or something like that to prevent, to prevent another fire? It's very unlikely it will be made of wood, and that's why I don't think the, the laser scan will be particularly useful um, on that end, but it, that also has not been decided one way or the other. There are precedents for using materials other than wood in these kinds of reconstructions. So at Chartres, for instance, um, there's a cast, um, cast and forged iron uh, roof that was already made in the 19th century, and also at Reims is another good example um, where the, the architect, for particular reasons, uh, used concrete. We'll see what happens here. I don't know yet what, what they'll use. When will the decision be made? Good. I don't know. I wish I knew. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for an illuminating and a wonderful lecture. Um, and Thankfully, um, Notre Dame de Paris will, has not, will not disappear because of technology. Can you comment at all on the cathedral at Reims, which is one of the places mm -hmm. to see? Because it was uh, tragically um, burned by the Germans during mm -hmm. World War I, along with many uh, other buildings mm -hmm. of French patrimony, and um, reconstructed over decades. Um, as I understand, with American, uh, a lot of Amer American um, help. So how was, could you just give a little bit of how that was done? And, it, and when we go to Reims now, is it really, you know, is it from photographs that it was reconstructed? Thank you. So uh, while Reims was damaged dramatically by the shelling um, during the First World War, much of the sculpture that was, was preserved, so much like we saw in this case, the roof was destroyed at Reims. The vaults were also really damaged, and then they were reconstructed. They were reconstructed from all kinds of representations. So they didn't have recourse to digital scans, right? But they did have many different kinds of graphic representations of the building, and also, of course, photography. So between those two things, um, they, they were able to, to restore. In some cases, in original materials, or as close as you could get to them, in limestone, and then, as I mentioned, in, in other cases, in modern materials as for the roof, um, for instance. It took about 20 years or so to do that, and so I think that's something to keep in mind as we move ahead, is a very careful restoration should also take place here. There should be time to take stock of what is all the debris, understand what is still there, what stones could be preserved, even if they have to move to the Musée de Cluny, for instance, um, before moving ahead and, and trying to clear things away, as if it were just debris and, and rubble. Thank you. Given your expertise and great passion mm -hmm. for Notre Dame de Paris, have the French reached out to you in any way, aside from the um, um, uh, Mr. Talon, uh, Professor Talon's um, images? I would say it's very interesting because that was what got picked up immediately was these images. That's been most of how I've um, uh, that's been the main reason I've been contacted, period, for the last five months. And it's, it was actually quite overwhelming at, at the beginning, just the sort of onslaught. On the other hand, I'm so 
sort of grateful to be able to carry on his legacy on that front. But I do imagine that at some point I'll pivot and get back to my own research. And, and it does still involve <laughs> this building. Um, and I also was, was in Paris this summer teaching and, and doing my own research. So, um, but it is true that that's where my, my efforts have been focused for the last few months. So I specifically focus on this building and its impact on architecture around the time that it was built. And that means over a really long period of time, sort of in the long durée. Um, I think I have this. Sorry, just yes. two quick questions. One, um, I think Philippe asked you about the, the concerns about collapsing now. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> one of the things I understood was that because of the water, mm -hmm. it was not clear how the walls would be affected or might be affected as the seasons changed. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about this? I know there are concerns now about turning cold. Yes, so particular, in any case, in any building, and especially a historic structure, the freeze-thaw cycle is worrisome. And so I think part of this has to do with the reason we know that Notre Dame wasn't going to fall down any other year was because it had done it the year before. And so with this new change, of course, the heat of the uh, canicule the other, uh, a few months ago, was of great concern. That was when the um, campaign had to be paused briefly and then was resumed. Um, but it, it all has to do with sort of um, contracting and expanding. Yeah. So we just are going to have to see. We're going to have to yeah. see. The, the other question was, you, you mentioned the Senate bill, but of course the Senate doesn't have the authority to um, stop Macron. So <laughs> as, as, you, as we currently understand it, <clears throat> there's still that um, decision, right, that mm -hmm. there's, there's an architectural competition and the competition will be decided ultimately by Macron or... So Whatever, the person right? who at this point really seems to be on the site and in charge is the architect en chef. So as much as there is the sort of Ministry of Culture response to all of this, what's happening on the ground so far has not been any different really from, except its sort of scale and the visibility of this campaign, from other restoration projects. Right. Um, and so we will see. It would be but remarkable though if, if he did sort of intervene and say, no, you're not going to do what you want to do. And yeah, instead I didn't we'll mean do so much whether they would be allowed to do, but whether or not the idea of doing something modern mm -hmm. and not reconstructing VLA's thing was going to prevail. I doubt it. I really doubt Just it. Just based on? Based on again, precedent. So in the yeah. cases of all of these cases, we, see, we saw new, very modern roofs, new materials used in the roof, which is under wraps and not visible. That's what we've seen in the past. In general, the, um, this sort of group of architects tends to be relatively conservative, traditional, and yeah. I just, I suspect that it, unless there were a real sort of power play from above, yeah. it's very unlikely that we'll, we'll be seeing a, a Frank yeah. Gehry, Notre Dame. I agree with you, but we'll see. <laughs> I have two quick questions as well. I had read uh, a couple of months ago that they were considering putting a whole dome over the cathedral to protect it from the vagaries of weather and changes in temperature. Has that been that plan been abandoned? As far as I know, it hasn't. So I, I was checking into what Philippe Villeneuve has been saying about what he's done since April, and he was mostly talking about this temporary structure that's in place. I think once the um, the scaffolding that was there for the previous restoration is dismantled, that will open up new questions of what to do about this gaping hole in the crossing. Um, and that could be done in many different ways, but I'm not sure that it's determined that it will be a dome or, or take any other form. And the other question I had, too, is I, I'd also read that despite promises of great funding from great billionaires, mm -hmm. that a lot that the money has only been trickling in to repair the cathedral. Is that true? Has that changed? If anyone works in development, you may know that there's a difference between a pledge and <laughs> cash in hand. <laughs> and that's what's happened. I, I don't think, I mean, so a couple of these cases are too, uh, a great vast quantity of the money, about two thirds of the money was to come from two, as you know, two important and uh, fervent Catholic billionaires. And while those were pledges, it doesn't necessarily, of course, I don't think they're going to renege and, and not give their money. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I do think that the concern, the, the narrative was, oh, Notre Dame has more money than it could ever know what to do with. And we'll see. I mean, keep your eye out. Uh, make sure this actually is true. We do want it to be preserved. Yes. Just uh, the wooden form in fill in the buttresses. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about sure. what that was responding to? Is it, was there some movement? So what they're worried about is when they remove the debris, the wooden debris especially, from the tops of the vaults, they're worried about what that's going to do. And if potentially the vaults start to press outward or if they even lose something there, they don't want the buttresses. They're, they are worried about the vaults falling down. Let me, that's the short answer. And if they were to do so, they don't want the buttresses to be pushing in and acting 
that way on the building, laterally inward on the building. And so what the, actually Philippe Villeneuve put this beautifully, there's a, a video that you can all go and look at if you know French, you'll, you'll enjoy it a lot, I think. Um, they've just presented about what they've been doing at the cathedral lately. And this is essentially the way he puts it is to transform the buttresses into walls. To neutralize the force, exactly, yes. Uh, given all the concerns that have been brought up, do you and other scholars that may be involved with this project actually think it will be finished in five years? I doubt it. <laughs> I think, again, using in, precedence in your, of other... In your considered opinion, how long, off the top of your head, how long... More than a decade, uh, more than a decade. I, th I think it's, again, just to look at what's happened before and the, the degree, the extent of the damage and the centrality of this building. Of course, there will be efforts to do it as quickly as possible, but also it needs to be done in a considered fashion. I think it will take a while. Completely speculation, by the way. <laughs> How do you Im uh, imagine that the cost of, uh, the financial cost of the uh, restitution will impact the current restitutions of other churches, such as saint germain de Pre and saint Sulpice. I do think that this will funnel funds to this project and take away from others. And as someone who works very often on buildings that are off the beaten path, it's, it is a little bit disconcerting. That said, there is one of the four organizations that was considered the place where you were supposed to send your money right after the fire, the Fondation du Patrimoine, they shifted, they pivoted, and once they thought they had plenty of money for Notre Dame, they shifted to a campaign that was more general called Plus Jamais Ça, and the idea is for other structures throughout the country uh, that could be allocated later on without being earmarked specifically for Notre Dame of Paris. So there is a, a, a desire to sort of harness this interest and, and channel it in other directions. Uh, <clears throat> I have another question mm -hmm. for you, if I may. When you showed the slide with the spire, mm -hmm. uh, which is Ville Le Duc, mm -hmm. uh, you indicated they, want, they wanted to restore it exactly as it was. As mm -hmm. it turns out, we do have a 15th century uh, representation by Jean Fouquet of, of yes. exactly what it looked like, mm -hmm. uh, proportionately <laughs> slightly smaller in, in the original. Mm -hmm. Why can't they go back to the Fouquet and, and do it the right way. Interesting, so it could. The question is which time of the cathedral do we want to restore to? And I think part of this comes from, I, I read, a, there was an interesting book published, a sort of pamphlet almost. There have been many, it's been an age of pamphleteering this summer about Notre Dame of Paris. And there's a Sorbonne professor, Adrien Goetz, and he writes about, he didn't know it was up for debate, the 19th century part of the building. He thinks that that has become, he's a 19th centuryist, this makes a lot of sense, right? But he doesn't believe that there's any question about this. And I, I think it is more of, a, more of a question we must ask. Of course it would be possible, you're right. We, we know what the spire, the medieval spire looked like. But particularly for those who work in the Monument Historique, they feel themselves in a lineage that began in many ways with Villers-le-Duc. And I feel like that's, this is now part of French cultural heritage as well. I just want to make one more comment. <clears throat> this is a very interesting photograph. We, we, we've been talking about detail, you know, structure and roofs and whatnot. It was interesting to just look at this detail, this elevation in terms of scale. It's this major, major, major object mm -hmm. in space, you know. And think of St. Patrick's Cathedral down the road here. This building is 420 feet long, Notre Dame. St. Patrick's, 332 feet. Mm -hmm. This one is 157 feet wide. St. Patrick's, 174. The spires, I think, about the same, maybe 30 feet difference. So imagine walking down Fifth Avenue and seeing this object in space like we do see this thing here yeah. and realize the scale and importance of that object, which happens to be a building <laughs> which affects everybody in and out using it or walking around. It's quite a remarkable photograph to bring that scale into and reality. And imagine everything being cleared away on Fifth Avenue so you could see St. Patrick's even better, right? I, I think it's true that the way that this is really a jewel in the city um, with low structures, low, low stru slung, slung structures all around it, um, it does really stick out. Its monumentality is still just as striking as it ever was. 
Um, I have an additional question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an architect, and uh, I received a lot of uh, uh, emails and so on regarding architectural news. Sure. And some months ago, I received the news about the finalists that the decision has been made mm. um, about the restoration of the Notre Dame. And um, to my recollection, it was a Korean team that... I think I know win. what you're talking about. Was it potentially the public? There was a public design competition. So yes, there were correct. many professional architects, of course, and the, I, the, the winners, I think it was three um, women architects who work for Skidmore Owings and Merrill in Chicago, my hometown, um, and they won this design competition. But it was a people's competition. It was a vote that you could do on the internet. It doesn't have any sort of standing in the world of this restoration. So it was not a legal one? It was, it not, was an not official no. one? It's very interesting. Also, I bought the book, um, so you can buy the book if you want to see all 50 of these projects. And the winners did have, there were interesting ideas in them. So I, I think it's interesting to consider what, if, is this the best architects can do? What would be the best architects could do to respond to this, to this structure? It's an interesting question, but I don't think it will have really any impact on the actual shape of Notre Dame of Paris. Well, that scheme was more or less the same, restoring it more or less the same, but it, larger spire that mm -hmm. also included some digital displays. Yes. Besides, besides getting more light in the middle of the, of the church, yes. also had all these digital displays. Uh, you know. And the hole in glass. Yeah, yes. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. but, it's, but it's not official. This is just a, the yeah, unofficial Notre Dame design competition. Thank you so much. Your enthusiasm is spectacular. <laughs> For those of us who knew a little, thank you. <laughs> However, <laughs> all of the other cathedrals, the Gothic churches, is this a bellwether? Should they also be scanned? I mean, you know, you're speaking, I am not from here, mm -hmm. but I'm extraordinarily in love with St. John the Divine. Yes, yes. I mean, should that be scanned for the future? Should St. Pat's? I mean, how do you approach that from your position? I Thank think you. absolutely. I hope that this has demonstrated the value. And I think it has also, particularly, I mentioned this company, Art Graphique et Patrimoine. They were the ones that went and took a laser scan shortly after the fire at Notre Dame. And I think they'll see this not only as a, an opportunity, an intellectual opportunity, but even potentially a financial opportunity um, and an insurance opportunity to take scans of other buildings in France. And certainly we should follow suit about with the historic structures that we care about. I think at the very least having these images is so valuable, even if it doesn't end up impacting what you do in the future, the idea that you can have a digital record of any building is that we do value this much is yes, we should do that. Um, Andrew Tallon had done many other scans, so it was not just Notre Dame of Paris, um, and other people have as well. So this is certainly an interest in medieval architectural studies, but I think now it's, it's entered into other domains um, as well. I don't mean to de-escalate the, the tone of this conversation, but I'm sure that some of you are familiar, and you probably are familiar with I saw it on the internet right after the, this awful event happened. The video game, I'm, I certainly have never played a video game in my life, mm -hmm. but for that month of April, you were allowed to download this, right. this video yes. game for free, right. to, which took you through all of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you familiar with that? Yes, so it was in, um, actually, at this point, I mean, the scan is actually relatively old, I suppose you could say, but so was the video game. So a relatively old video game called Assassin's Creed. I asked my brother about this, and he said, why are you asking about me about this ancient video game? Um, and the, yes, it does, as many video games do. This is also something that, in fact, I work with some students who this is probably what they'll end up doing, is, is recreating architectural worlds um, in video games. Um, and... It's not the difference between, if you're wondering, what's the difference between that and this laser scan? The laser scan is much more accurate. Um, it's down to a level of accuracy that the video game never was supposed to, supposed to achieve. So it's a beautiful image. It allows you to move around, to walk around. There are many things to, to recommend it. But in terms of its use for this kind of technical purpose, it wouldn't have as much validity. Other questions? Anybody else for a last um, 
thought or question for Lindsay? All right, going once. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much again. Thank you all.